Good morning, Church of the Resurrection. Let us worship together. Would you please stand? Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let us sing together. be seated as you are able. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ says. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Let us take a moment and confess our sins against God and our neighbor, kneeling or seated as you are able. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. 
that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on us. Forgive us all our sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen us in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Please stand. Lord, open our lips. And our mouth shall proclaim your praise. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. Come, let us adore him. Be joyful in the Lord, all, all you lands. lands. Serve, Serve the, the Lord with gladness, with gladness and come, come before his presence with a song. Know this, the Lord himself is God. He, he himself, himself has made, made us, and we are his. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving. Go into his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, and call upon his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his faithfulness endures from age to age. The earth is the Lord's, for he made it. Come, let us adore him. Today's New Testament lesson is from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through chapter 2, verses 2. This is the message we have heard from him and proclaim to you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hi, I'm Dan Clare. I'm one of the pastors here at the Church of the Resurrection, and I want to talk with you today about having confidence in Christ from 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through chapter 2, verse 2. Last Sunday, we started a new sermon series on 1 John, which John wrote in verse 3 in order to strengthen our relationships with God and with one another. Like today, there were, when John wrote this letter, lots of religious options. And there were false teachers infiltrating the church and proclaiming heretical, destructive teachings, just as there are today. So John wrote to give personal testimony of what the Lord Jesus had passed on to him and the other apostles and what they had experienced so that, verse 3, we might also enjoy koinonia or community or fellowship. This is the biblical word for fellowship, both vertically with God and horizontally with one another. Community is a big selling point for any organization, of course, whether it's a sports team or a social club or at work where you choose to work. And um, the same is true when you choose a church. You naturally want to be a part of a congregation with whom you enjoy the fellowship of the people. But as Salmani mentioned last week, there is just more to the biblical idea of koinonia or fellowship than just simply what the snacks are like after church or uh, whether you enjoy the people. There's something in this biblical concept of community that goes much, much deeper to the idea of partnership, of, of mutual interdependency, of sharing things in common with one another, uh, needs, hurts, hopes, and dreams. 
It's the kind of mutual interdependence that is so vital that being away from one another on a Sunday feels very costly. You want to stay connected because it's essential. It's essential to your own life and vocation, and, um, and the whole community depends upon it. That's biblical koinonia, community, fellowship. It's something I long for very much, and I hope that you do too. And in order to have this kind of deep fellowship with one another, John writes that we must first have it with God. In fact, if you're wondering, um, why don't my church friendships go very deep? It's very possible that it's because either you or your friends lack a very deep relationship with God. That's where this kind of fellowship begins. So how do we do it? How do we enjoy a deeper relationship with God and thereby go deeper with one another? That's what today's passage is all about. And before we dive into it together, let's pray. We thank you, Father, for your word, and we thank you that we can study it together. We ask that you would speak to us through it now and guide us as we study. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and help us to learn from you, hear from you, and follow you uh, as, we, as we hear you speak today. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to talk about three truths from this passage, the truth about God, the truth about us, and the truth about Jesus Christ. So first of all, the truth about God, and how do we go deeper with God? We need to begin, first of all, with the truth about God. We've got to know who he is and what he's like in order to have fellowship with him. And this is where John takes us in chapter 1, verse 5, passing along to us what he and the other apostles learned from the Lord Jesus. He writes, this is the message that we have heard from him and proclaim to you that God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Jesus taught this truth to the apostles. Now John's teaching it to us. And as he often does, John says it in two ways, first, first positively and then negatively. He says positively God is light and negatively there's no darkness in him whatsoever, which is just the way light works, of course. Light always dispels the darkness. Recently, my wife and I went away for the weekend, and we stayed in a hotel, and we were very much looking forward to getting some sleep that night. Um, we were hoping to sleep in the next morning, and our hotel room had a big window that faced to the east, which seemed like it might prevent us from sleeping in. But there was a little sign by the window that advertised and boasted that the hotel window blinds were blockout blinds, so we had nothing to worry about, at least according to what it said on the sign. So we pulled down the shades and we went to bed. And when the sun rose that next morning at 5.47 a.m., who do you think won this cosmic battle? There were the one millimeter blockout shades in this corner, and there was, of course, the sun, our nearest star, weighing in at some 1.3 million times the size of our Earth. And sure enough, as the sun rose, there was a black rectangle surrounded by a very bright square of light, and it illumined the entire hotel room. We were up and didn't sleep in. The summer sun dispelled the darkness in our room, just as it had done from the very beginning when God created the heavens and the earth. And it dispelled the darkness just like when Jesus came in the beginning of the new creation. And he, the light of the world, began preaching the good news around the Sea of Galilee. And evil spirits fled from him, and he healed the sick, and he raised the dead, and he condemned the Pharisees for injustice and hypocrisy. That's what always happens when God's light shines. This old church building is new to us in 2021, and we're currently engaged in a huge effort with the Lord's help to save and renovate it. And among the hundreds of projects going on right now is repairing or replacing lighting throughout the building, particularly all those old fluorescent bulbs that are buzzing and just barely glowing. So we've started replacing them with new LED technology, which is um, better for the environment and more energy efficient, and uh, also a lot brighter. But there's a downside 
to bright lighting in an old building like this, and it's that wherever the light shines brighter, we discover more problems with the building, more things in need of repair, which leads to John's second point, which is the truth about us. First, the truth about God is that God is light, and him there's no darkness whatsoever. And wherever the light shines, it reveals what is broken and in need of repair. So secondly, the truth about us is that we are broken and in need of renovation. Though we try to suppress the truth about us with all our energy, we still know it deep down inside, don't we? And whenever we come into the light of God's word or the light of God's presence amongst God's people, the truth about us becomes evident once again. I'm broken, you're broken, for we all have sinned. We have not loved God with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. Sometimes we're truly sorry and we humbly repent. Other times we're indifferent or perhaps even defiant because we want to turn out the lights and we want to do our own thing. See, I like the way I look, or at least the way I think I look, when the lights are dim under the buzz of the dim fluorescence. I think I'm a pretty handsome young guy. I think I've got a nice head of hair, and um, I think I'm pretty fit, at least when I suck in my stomach. But the other day I saw a candid outdoor photo taken from behind, and I was appalled. It was what they call a hard truth. I'm getting old, I'm, I'm starting to thin on top and fill out in the middle. And it's a little jarring. I'm shocked to see what I look like out in the light. And I'm thinking about asking the parish council to put a stop to installing any more of these LED lights. Seriously, when the light shines upon us, one of the first lines of response is the same as the cockroach we go running for the darkness. And then once we're back in the dark, in the shadows, we can get on with our self-deception, keep those blackout shades drawn, keep our eyes closed, and reimagine ourselves in a better light. And John's one of us. He knows what it's like. He knows firsthand how the game is played. And so he speaks to these things in the rest of chapter 1. He, he knows that it's also a dead end. So he says in verses 6 through 10, um, putting the spotlight on some of our self-deceptive ways so that we might recognize them and also grasp the deadly consequences of them. Take a look at verses 6 and 7. John says, If we say we have fellowship with God while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. As I mentioned at the beginning, one of the reasons we sometimes lack deep, positive friendships in the church is because we don't go deep with God. And here John shows us why. It's because of dishonesty about our relationship with God. If we say that we have koinonia or community or fellowship with God, when in fact we walk with darkness, that is the Hebrew idiom of, of living day by day in darkness, well, preferring the darkness over the light, we don't have fellowship with God. We don't have that koinonia. It's nothing more than superficial chit-chat. We're lying about our relationship with God, and that's killing us because it undermines all of the potentially uh, virtuous relationships in our lives with God and with others. John goes on in verse 8 to say this, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. The longer we go on denying our brokenness, the more entrenched we become in self-deception. We hide in the darkness, insulating ourselves from the truth, and we make alliances with others in the darkness who will play along and who will agree with our self-deception in exchange for our supporting their own self-deception. Tell me I'm not thinning out on top, and I won't say anything about your alcoholism, and I'll laugh at your racist jokes. That's the way it works. Now, apparently, the false teachers in John's day were encouraging Christians to say that they were without sin. These false teachers were most likely 
something that eventually became known as Gnosticism about a century later. But in those days, it was still posturing as a part of Christianity, kind of new and improved version of Christianity. And the big idea of Gnosticism was one that is very familiar to us today, a hard and fast distinction between outside and inside, between your external body and your internal identity. Some Gnostics disregarded sin because they believed that what you did with your external body didn't matter. What was really important, they said, was being true to the divine spark within you. Hopefully through knowledge or what we might even call science today, you could even break free from the constraints of your own body, your physical body, in order to become your true self, to have fellowship with other enlightened true selves, and eventually to join with the divine energy of the cosmos. Of course, we're living in a very similar time today, aren't we? There's a new religion that's all the rage, preaching a gospel of salvation through being true to your inner self. Right now, it's called science or progress, and it's presented as something that's entirely compatible with Christianity or with any other religion, so long as you come out, be true to whoever you feel that you are inside, regardless of your physical body. So in my case, the new gospel says I don't have a sin problem, nor is my hair thinning or is my belly getting bigger. So long as I stop living a lie and start being true to who I really am on the inside. And if you won't support me in it, well, then it's you who have a problem. And I'll go and find other true friends who have also come out and we together will welcome and affirm one another in our identities regardless of what you or anybody else or even our own bodies say. John says in verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. John takes us back to the word of God, shining in the, in the light of God and asks, who are you going to believe? Those so-called friends in the darkness who keep saying that God is lying so that the whole lot of you may keep living a lie together? Or will you believe God's true word? His light shining in the darkness reveals the unvarnished truth about us all. And we mustn't be surprised or despair over the current cultural conspiracy to extinguish the light. No matter how strong our blackout shades may be, they will never stop the light from penetrating the darkness and from breaking through into our self-deception. We can't keep it out. We also can't survive it on our own. Because again, the truth about God is that God is light. In him there is no darkness, no evil at all, and he is like a refining fire that burns away all impurities and every sin. Nothing tainted with sin can survive for even a moment in his presence. And because secondly, the truth about us is that we are sinners. Fellowship with God is rather complicated. Which leads us to a third truth from today's passage, the truth about Christ. John doesn't abandon us to be charbroiled by the light. He points us to Jesus, who is uniquely able to cleanse us from sin and to bring us into God's presence and unite us in genuine fellowship with one another. Look at chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. John writes, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. Listen to John's tender compassion as he writes to the early church and to us with this fatherly love wanting us to have victory in the fight against sin, but also fully aware, knowing our weaknesses, and wanting us to have Jesus as our advocate and our savior. We live in a do-it-yourself culture. We like to fix our own problems, and yet we all have our own limits, don't we? We all recognize that there are times when we get in over our heads and we have to call for expert help. And when it comes to dealing appropriately with our sin, Jesus is the expert that we need. He's the advocate and savior who can really help us. 
couple of months back, uh, Luke Archer in our church was down in the basement of the foyer, and he started seeing some deterioration of some concrete beams supporting the foyer. And so he took out a flashlight, and in the light was able to see uh, some further deterioration. Um, but what that meant was uh, beyond him, so he called in some others from, from the church, and the rest of us had a look at it, and we were all stumped. And so we eventually called in um, some structural engineers who had a look, and uh, after a while, and after paying a substantial amount of money, we now have um, really, really cool braces and expensive braces under our foyer and supporting it, and it's very sturdy now. Um, we'll probably never know for sure whether we needed to act with urgency on, on those braces, um, but after this recent condo collapse in Miami, um, so many lives lost, and another building, a five-story building, collapsed here in Northwest DC. I'm really thankful for Luke's decision early on to call for an expert, to call for expert help, because you don't want to take chances with this sort of thing. And you don't want to take chances with sin, either, because we all have sinned, we all need expert help, and Jesus is the only one who can help us. John says, he is the propitiation, that is the atoning sacrifice for our sins and for everyone else in the whole world through all time. He laid down his own life for us so that we might be ransomed from sin and death and that we might join the family of God. So give him your allegiance, give him your faith and follow him with your life so that you might be saved. And if you haven't taken this step before, I hope that you'll speak with me or one of the other church staff so that we can help you as you take this leap of faith. And when we put our faith in Jesus, we can walk in the light with God and with one another. His blood covers us like sunscreen so that we might have true fellowship with our holy, righteous, sinless, heavenly Father. That's essentially what John says at the end of chapter 1, verse 7. He says, the blood of Jesus, his Son, cleanses us from all sin so that we may move towards God rather than fleeing from him. We no longer have to hide from the light like cockroaches. We don't have to make these absurd alliances with others in the darkness to try to block out the light. All we have to do is put our faith in Jesus and confess our sins. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, we need to come clean with the Lord, no longer suppressing the truth about those things that we have done that we ought not to have done and the things that we have left undone and we ought to have done. Rather, we humbly speak these things to the Lord in prayer so that we might be cleansed of them, cleansed of them forever. And hopefully, we speak of them to other Christians as well. Part of what it means to be in biblical koinonia, that kind of community or fellowship is that we find it increasingly natural to talk with other Christians about our own sin and to ask them for help in turning away from it. Instead of finding friends in the darkness to help us block out the light, we can find fellowship with those who are also covered by the blood of Jesus and whose alliance with us helps us more faithfully walk in the light. Because it's Jesus who covers us, there's a lot less shame in confessing our sins since we are no longer having to keep up appearances. We aren't gathered because we're cool or because we're smart or because we're good looking or authentic to our true selves. We don't have to be self-righteous because we aren't self-justified. Rather, we're Jesus-justified people, which should alleviate all the performance pressures. Now, speaking very um, practically about confession for a moment, it's good to confess your sins to other Christians. Um, not all other Christians, which would be impossible, nor even all the Christians in your church or even probably your community group. Rather, I recommend cultivating a couple of deep Christian friendships with whom you can be honest about your sin and who are agreed with you on three C's 
compassion, conviction, and confidentiality. Compassion because we all sin and we need tender, gentle encouragement as brothers and sisters in the Lord. Conviction because we all are in this together and often that fight against sin requires teamwork. And whenever we talk with one another about sin, we ought to be saying, what are we going to do about it rather than what are you going to do about it? And of course, confidentiality, because that's the basis of a good friendship and it's the best environment for growing in holiness. So cultivate deep Christian friendships with others, uh, deep friendships with whom you can confess your sins with compassion, conviction, and confidentiality. And if you don't have such friendships yet, or if you ever want to talk about sin with one of the pastors in the church, we're always here for you. We're always eager to do so. We have a liturgy in the Book of Common Prayer that makes, us, makes it easy for us to do so. And in so doing, we're able to give you a little bit more formal assurance of God's forgiveness. And so we're happy to do that. Just make an appointment, and we're eager to pray with you about these things. Finally, I'd just like to close with a word about walking in the light together. You may know that our church was uh, started as a mission of the Anglican Church in Rwanda nearly 20 years ago. We were commissioned by them to plant Anglican churches, faithful Anglican churches, starting here in Washington, D.C. on Capitol Hill. Their heart for spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the world came out of something called the East African Revival, which began in the early 1930s in Rwanda. And it started when two men, a white English doctor who was a missionary in Rwanda and a black Ugandan pastor came together and developed a very deep friendship in the Lord. And the key to their friendship was their own commitment to walk in the light together. That's what they called it. They were walking in the light, which included confessing their sins and encouraging one another in holiness day by day. And this deep friendship in the Lord that these two men had, this biblical koinonia or community, developed at the same time that racial segregation was being foisted on colonial East Africa. And in the midst of such hatred and ethnic division, the love of these two brothers sparked a fire that became a revival across the church in Rwanda and Uganda and spread to Kenya and Tanzania. And hundreds of thousands of lives were changed as people came to faith in Jesus Christ and lived for him for the rest of their lives. And that same spirit continues in the Church of Rwanda to this day. It was hugely transformative in those days and all the way up until now because of the commitment of these two men and all who followed after them to walk in the light together. Now the truth about Jesus, as we've learned, is that he is our advocate and savior. He's the expert who can save us from sin and bring us into fellowship with God true koinonia with God and with one another. And so through him, through Jesus, we can have this. We can walk in the light. We can walk in the light with God and with one another. That's what the Anglican Church of Rwanda wanted for us when we got started almost 20 years ago. And it's what I want, and I know it's what you want as well. So let's walk in the light together as we put this, pra this passage into practice as a church. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your word, and we ask your blessings upon our practice of walking in the light together. Help us, give us your grace, and continue, Lord, to cleanse us from sin and let the light shine through us as we go out from this place for you. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Let's join together in confessing our faith according to the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe, I believe in, in God, God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day He rose again. 
he ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let's pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Show us your mercy, O Lord. And grant us your salvation. Clothe your ministers with righteousness. Let your people sing with joy. Give peace, O Lord, in all the world. For only in you can we live in safety. Lord, keep this nation under your care. And guide us in the way of justice and truth. Let your way be known upon earth. Your saving health among all nations. Let not the needy, O Lord, be forgotten. Nor the hope of the poor be taken away. Create in us clean hearts, O God. And sustain us with your Holy Spirit. A collect for Sundays, O God, our King, by the resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, on the first day of the week, you conquered sin, put death to flight, and gave us the hope of everlasting life. Redeem all our days by this victory, forgive our sins, banish our fears, make us bold to praise you and to do your will, and steal us to wait for the consummation of your kingdom on the last great day, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And a collect for mission. Lord Jesus Christ, you stretched out your arms of love on the hard wood of the cross that everyone might come within the reach of your saving embrace. So clothe us in your spirit that we, reaching forth our hands in love, may bring those who do not know you to the knowledge and love of you for the honor of your name. Amen. Amen. Now let me invite you to pause the video now and take some time to pray, offering up your own petitions and thanksgivings as the Lord leads, and then join us again as we close out this time of prayer. Let's join together in saying the general thanksgiving. Almighty God, Father of all mercies, we, your unworthy servants, give you humble thanks for all your goodness and loving kindness to us and to all whom you have made. We bless you for our creation, preservation, and all the blessings of this life, but above all for your immeasurable love in the redemption of the world by our Lord Jesus Christ, for the means of grace and for the hope of glory. And we pray, give us such an awareness of your mercies that with truly thankful hearts we may show forth your praise, not only with our lips, but in our lives, by giving up ourselves to your service and by walking before you in holiness and righteousness all our days through Jesus Christ our Lord, to whom with you and the Holy Spirit be honor and glory throughout all ages. Amen. Let's sing together. Please stand.
shall I reach that happy place and be forever blessed? Where shall I see my Father's face and in His bosom rest? I am bound. Thanks for joining us for worship today. Will you please now join with me in this prayer of St. Chrysostom. Almighty God, you have given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplication to you. And you have promised through your well-beloved Son that when two or three are gathered together in his name, you will be in the midst of them. Fulfill now, O Lord, our desires and petitions as may be best for us, granting us in this world knowledge of your truth and in the age to come, life everlasting. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Now may the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace.